be set up downstairs to our much more cosy and uh, intimate, intimate. intimate, homemade uh, <laughs> version that academics are much more used to. Um, but uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll have some fantastic discussions arising from some of the papers. So please just keep coming in, keep coming in, go up the back there. Do you want to just move a long one? Um, yeah, keep, keep coming in. All right, um, what I'd like to do is um, introduce David Ball. What's your current designation, David? There isn't one. Current, uh, current designation, um, mysterious, um, <laughs> but uh, certainly a bit of a figure in the Space Industry Association, and, and he's going to um, host this session, which is actually sponsored by the Space Industry Association, which is focusing a bit more on some of the uh, economic and business elements of of earth mining. So, please uh, welcome David, and then I can have a bit of a rest. I'm not trying to. Keep you. Thank you, Andrew. As a uh, communications engineer, I found this morning sessions on mining and space uh, all far from where I'm used to in the satellite industry. But, uh, here we are upstairs in our cosy environment, as, uh, as Andrew. We have quite a session, uh, interesting session this afternoon. We have a number of presenters uh, by video, uh, one recorded, a number by live by Skype, so that will have all its uh, inherent uh, fun and games, I'm sure. But uh, we have uh, quite a varied presentation this afternoon. So starting off, I'll give you a little bit of background on the Space Industry Association. As Andrew mentioned, I'm uh, on the executive of the Space Industry Association. I'm the one who sends all the uh, please pay your bills for your membership renewal notices out as a treasurer. So the SIAA is the uh, peak industry association for space in Australia and it's really focused around industry. Uh, we have a quite a <coughs> wide variety of membership which I'll go into shortly. Established in 92 and representing the industrial base in Australia together with the educational base to government. Um, we have great membership growth over the last few years which has been really good to see uh, thanks to the leadership of uh, Brett Pinkson and now Michael Davis and Roger Franson, as we went through that period. Um, regular program of industry consultation, public speaking engagements and so forth. Uh, the, the current office holders, uh, Roger Franson is the chair. Roger's just taken a role at CSIRO working on the SKA project. Uh, Jeff Kasperian out of Adelaide was at the Uni of SA ITR. Uh, Deputy Chair Stephen Ward here in Sydney at Symbios. Treasurer David Ball is no longer at NewSat. Um, New South shut down back in July. Uh, Michael Davis is the secretary, based in Adelaide, and immediate past chair is Brett Biddington. And Brett's also working with us, acting as the CEO of a small conference we we're planning to host in 2017. Um, here's a list of the SIAA main, the main members of the organisation. Obviously, ACSER here today as one of our long-term members for the UNSW. Uh, a number of the industrial members you see from the size of Lockheed Martin and Boeing down to smaller companies, a number of the universities involved, and uh, we have a lot of individual members as well. The conference I've referred to in 2017 is the International Astronautical Congress, which will be hosted in Adelaide in 2017. Uh, the SIAA led the, the bid with the Adelaide and South Australian uh, government to win that. Uh, we expect about 3,500 delegates uh, would be held in October of 2017, so under under two years to run now. Um, the theme space unlocking imagination, fostering innovation, and strengthening security. Uh, so it was voted on in Toronto. Uh, we're working through all the logistics and process now to get sponsorships and exhibit space leased out and so forth. Uh, thankfully, Lockheed Martin uh, stepped forward as the anchor sponsors for the event, and we're extremely grateful to Lockheed Martin for that sponsorship. More to follow on that. And Brett Biddington, as I mentioned, is the CEO of the IAC Big Committee, or the IAC Organising Committee, and we meet regularly to talk through the, the various processes and progress. So, SAAA Industry Development, I won't spend too much time on this, uh, looking at really to create more vibrancy and size in the association to achieve our goals, increase the level of activity and profile of the organisation. Uh, along with that, hand-in-hand -hand goes networking, we will important networking events, 
um, little exchange of information, political awareness, and that's an initial we battle with this in Australia with the government and whether they're aware of space and how much profile we get with space. I believe there's new, new moves to put with the new government to get uh, increased profile there. And even increased media coverage obviously goes hand in hand with that. Excuse me. So the next, uh, I'll move straight into our, if there are no questions on SIAA, I'll move straight into the first of the presentations this afternoon. I assume if I click on this it will work. Do the intro first. Uh, Chad Anderson from Space Angels Network. This is a recorded uh, video we got from Chad this afternoon. Chad's from a business, from a business background and enjoyed a successful career at J.P. Morgan Chase, where he managed a $50 billion real estate portfolio during the recession. After earning his MBA from Oxford, he worked on the UK National Space Strategy for 18 months to grow the sector in that country. He, there he led a team which wrote the economic case for a UK space port. Chad is a prominent advocate of the emerging private space industry with numerous public speaking appearances, interviews and papers on the subject, including a publication in the Space Policy Journal and the first ever market assessment for commercial lunar services. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you via video. I apologize that I couldn't be there in person or via Skype. I'm on a plane at the moment and we're coordinating and uh, in flight by flight, it's a little flight way to cut it Skype call. Uh, but honestly, if I could have made things work, uh, I would be there with you in Australia in a second. So I've been asked to speak today about a market study that I authored a couple of years ago called Moon Prospect, the demand for commercial lunar services. And I just want to spend some time today uh, talking to you about three things. Uh, one, how the report came about. Two, what's happened since then. And three, what I think is coming next. So where the report came from. Um, when I was at Oxford doing my MBA and transitioning into the commercial space sector, I came across Astrobotic, uh, which, is a small, which is a small startup in Pittsburgh building a lunar transportation system. And now here was a, a young entrepreneurial team that was competing for the largest prize competition in history, and they showed a lot of promise. They came from one of the world's leading robotics universities, Carnegie Mellon, and have experience like putting rovers on every continent on the planet. Their robots were the first into nuclear disasters, and they've won the DARPA uh, Urban Lunar Challenge, sorry, the DARPA Urban Challenge, which was uh, uh, testing autonomous vehicles. I liked their approach. I liked that they, that they were building systems from scratch and they were focused on building a long-term business, even at the expense of winning the XPRIZE. I mean, the XPRIZE was a, a key catalyst for the genesis of the company, and if they win the $30 million, that would certainly help their case. Indeed, they, they, they won $1.75 million in milestone prizes, and that was a big boon for the company. But they always had their sights set on a much bigger prize. And that was the pent-up demand for affordable, viable access to the moon. And they were doing this while operating on a tight budget. As far as lunar transportation systems go, uh, but they were also super resourceful and were accomplishing some, some incredible things with very little. So I began speaking with the CEO and offered my services. I realized that no one had yet looked critically at the potential market for lunar transportation. And try to size up exactly how big this thing could be. So I asked if it would be helpful if I did a market sizing exercise and decided to take this on as an MBA project to better understand the market for myself and satisfy my own curiosity uh, to do what I could to help humanity get back to the moon because I think it's very important for a number of reasons and to support a company that I really believe in. Now, this report was by no means perfect, but it really wasn't intended to be. It was meant to be a first attempt at segmenting the market to help get our arms around who the customers might be and how big this market could potentially get. So where to start? Who are the potential customers? So after extensive research, I settled on eight different potential market segments that could be interested in paying for lunar transportation. Media and advertising, education, science and exploration, technology test and demonstration, defense and security, infrastructure support, supplies, resource extraction, and tourism. Now obviously each one of these 
uh, wants different types of services and at different price points, um, different points in the timeline of development. So what were the types of services that delivery service, like Alistair Robotic, could offer and what could they charge? They could drop satellites into lunar orbit, they could deliver payload to the surface, or they could collect data and sell that information back to the customer. In terms of what you could charge, we were really in uncharted territory. So I started with a few data points that were out there, yes, there were a few, and used cost as a base. And here the company had a significant advantage because instead of buying old NASA hardware and modifying it, they were building their systems from scratch and they were doing it at a cost that was an incredible fraction of anything that had been done before. And then in order to size this thing up, I needed to put everything on a standard unit of measurement, equal in terms of cost per unit. Anyway, what I found was that the demand for lunar transportation services is sustained and appears sufficient to support multiple service providers. The total baseline that I found through 2020, which is uh, when I did the projection to, is expected to grow to $2 billion in total annual revenue, which at present day capacity would support multiple missions per year. The baseline that I put together reflects steady and increasing demand based on current trends and interest from governments, commercial businesses, and academia. Lunar surface delivery for infrastructure will be the greatest source of demand for lunar surfaces, I think, um, making up almost half of the total. And as something of a land grab, I think the companies will want to be the first to lay the pig iron, so to speak. The first to provide power, communications, and other essentials will have an advantage over anyone else who comes uh, after them. And the second largest area of demand that I found is uh, mining uh, at uh, nearly 40% of the total. And as this study attempted to demonstrate, resource extraction, I think, will play a key role in the development of the lunar economy. The demand, primarily driven by, by surface payload delivery of prospecting and mining robots, because commercial mining has a clear operating process and path to profitability and competition, this industry is likely to be a key customer for lunar services. So the obvious question is that if this market's really this big, then why hasn't anyone done it? Um, what technical advancements have made this possible. And I think there are a few things that have enabled this market opportunity now for the very first time. SpaceX has opened up all kinds of frontiers for space startups. Players like Astrobotic take over from translunar injection, but someone needs to get them there on a schedule and a price point that allows their business case to close. Before SpaceX, I just don't think that this would have been possible. Autonomous guidance systems have come a long way. The very first uh, visually guided autonomous landing happened just a few months ago. And there's also a number of companies developing rovers to carry out preliminary missions on the lunar surface, which their uh, own sets with their own sets of customers and, and businesses to support. So what's happened since this report? Uh, the market's beginning to demonstrate itself, and it's public and private demand. They are, there are big space agencies that everyone knows about, but there's also a large and growing number of emerging smaller space agencies that have ambitions in space, and these ambitions extend to the moon. Uh, people used to say that, you know, that's some great technology that you're developing there, but where's the business case? So we put together the business case. We put together a market study and honed the business proposition. Then they came back with, um, okay, that's great, you've got a business case, but who's gonna pay for this? Um, then the company signed their first customer, then another, then another. Then they came back with, okay, that's great that you have customers, but where's the long-term demand for lunar transportation going to come from? Then the new uh, ESA director took over, and the first thing that he said was that he's going to de develop a lunar outpost from the far side of the moon. So again and again, this market is demonstrating itself. There are a number of new reports coming out pointing to how commercial partnerships can slash the cost of human uh, lunar missions, uh, following on the success of SpaceX agreements, such as COTS, which helps SpaceX get up and going. NASA has extended this model to companies targeting the moon through a SpaceX agreement called Catalyst. There's been big advances in regulation. At the time of writing this report, a big question mark was around property rights, but in May of this year, You've probably heard that the House passed a bill called the Space Act, 
which states that any asteroid resources obtained in outer space are the property of the entity that obtained such resources, which shall be entitled to all property rights thereto, consistent with applicable provisions of federal law. So this still has some way to go, but this is a big step toward property rights in space, and it has people like Bigelow, um, who's developing inflatable habitats to fly on the moon, making them very excited about the future. So what's coming next? Well, we're seeing more and more interest in the moon, so the future looks very bright from where I'm sitting. Astrobotic is going to launch at the end of 2017. They'll be the first commercial company to land on the moon, carrying significant payloads of customers from at least five different nations. A successful mission will unlock demand and will be the catalyst for an entire market, just as low-cost access from companies like SpaceX, NanoRacks, and Spaceflight Industries has stimulated an entire market of small satellites addressing a multitude of markets. The incredibly high capability and low price point of Astrobotic will stimulate an entire market of lunar infrastructure, developers, scientists, resource extraction. I believe there will be a lunar outpost established in the next 10 to 20 years, which, uh, whether it's developed by Europeans, Russians, or private companies, personally, I believe it's going to be a combination. Um, of public and private, um, but Russia and Europe have plans to put uh, humans on the lunar surface in the next 10 to 15 years, which uh, would require a great deal of robotic preparation. Once we're there, things really start to open up. Open up. Cislunar infrastructure becomes that much more significant, which paves the way for branching out farther into the solar system. Um, really exciting times ahead. So. Thank you. Um, enjoy the conference. I wish I was there with you. Uh, talk to you guys soon. Bye. It was an interesting uh, presentation from Chad. I think the 